Well, I'm really, I'm really glad to be here. I, I work uh, just across the street uh, on the other side of Old Georgetown Road in that uh, glass uh, building, the uh, Porter Neuroscience Center, Building 35, and uh, come over here usually when it, there's some kind of medical emergency in our, in our group or in our, fa our family or neighbors. Uh, I, to start off with, I should say the title's a little different from what you see on the, uh, uh, as advertised. Uh, I will be touching on uh, diagnosis and management of these diseases, but the main focus of the talk is on developing treatment, because I, uh, in my mind, that's the most interesting aspect of uh, converting uh, the fruits of the Human Genome Project into clinical practice. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention at the beginning, I, uh, I realized when I was putting this together, is that this is a, kind of an updated version of a talk I gave across the street over in uh, Mazur uh, for the uh, Astute Clinician series. So uh, those of you who are here for that or there for that talk, uh, there will be some overlap. Let's see here. So. Uh, the other thing is uh, I have nothing that I have to disclose. As an NIH employee, I'm not paid for outside activities, uh, but there are some uh, kind of volunteer activities that I thought would be good to mention verbally uh, to, to keep in mind as I go through this talk. I serve as an unpaid member of advisory boards for a number of voluntary, uh, for patient foundations, voluntary organizations, whoa, and uh, these are both uh, within the United States and, and abroad, uh, so the Muscular Dystrophy Association, uh, the Spinal Muscular Atrophy Foundation. Uh, and uh, the French Muscular Dystrophy Association, the AFM. And I'm also uh, an unpaid member of advisory boards for a couple of uh, companies, uh, Biogen, IDEC, and Prosensa. And uh, one uh, thing uh, that I also wanted to mention is that I've just finished a sabbatical, uh, a six-month sabbatical in industry. Uh, uh, in government speak, this is a training experience, uh, and I was at uh, Novartis, Novartis Institutes for Biomedical Research in Cambridge, Massachusetts for six months, and I think that uh, is something that gives a, a kind of perspective on what I'm going to be talking about, but it's also good to bear in mind. Uh, where I was in Cambridge, uh, on the uh, east side of the city of Cambridge, a industrial, formerly industrial area around the MIT campus, uh, Kendall Square and Central Square, uh, there is an amazing uh, burst of activity in uh, biotech and pharmaceutical companies. Uh, uh, a number of different companies have sprouted up uh, in that area on, uh, I think, land that was owned and managed by MIT. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> where I was uh, was a, a former uh, candy factory, a uh, Neko candy factory, and across the street from where I was working in, in Cambridge uh, was a park uh, that was developed. Uh, along with the uh, in industry development in that area. And, and there, there was a, uh, uh, engra engraved in stone in the monument in the park was this quote from uh, Henry Thoreau uh, from Walden that was published in 1854. And I think it captures the sense of being up there uh, on sabbatical is what recommends commerce to me is its enterprise and bravery. Commerce is unexpectedly confident and serene, alert, adventurous, and unwearied. And I, I think this captures the spirit of uh, these companies in that area uh, with academic uh, collaborators who are trying, working to develop treatment to reduce the burden of disease that I'll be talking about. Now, this is a slide. Uh, this next slide is one that uh, I've been using now for uh, over almost 10 years. It uh, uh, originated from Maynard Olson and uh, Francis Collins, and uh, I, I think that it uh, is good at showing uh, in context uh, the work that we do. We meaning uh, all the people working on uh, hereditary diseases, uh, using the Human Genome Project to uh, identify the causes of these diseases and use that information for diagnosis and, and development of treatment. Now, what you can see here is uh, it, a process that begins and ends with patients. So clinicians uh, who see patients have to uh, start by characterizing the disease, the phenotype, the clinical manifestations of the disease, collect samples from patients and family members uh, to do, uh, to map the disease gene and identify the disease gene. Now this has become a lot easier over the last few years with uh, uh, 
uh, high throughput sequencing uh, methods. We can sequence through all, all the genes uh, in the genome. Uh, the coding regions are all the genes. And uh, identify the specific mutations that track with the disease in these families, uh, sequence variants. Uh, that are specific to the disease, and that tells us what the cause of the disease is. It's, uh, it gives us a very accurate um, diagnostic test that can be used uh, to identify, to see who's got the disease and who doesn't. And for the diseases I'm talking about today, these diagnostic tests have been available now for uh, o o over 10 years, 10, 15, 20 years uh, for the, uh, the two diseases I'm going to focus on, Duchenne muscular dystrophy and spinal muscular atrophy. But with the disease gene identified, we can characterize the disease gene. We can see what is the normal function of that gene and how do the mutations affect that normal function. Uh, and then we can identify or uh, develop uh, uh, animals, uh, mice, uh, flies. Uh, worms uh, uh, that have uh, the animal equivalent of the disease by uh, putting the same kind of alteration into the animals. And we can develop cell culture systems to study, use these animals uh, and cell culture systems to uh, work out the disease mechanism and start to uh, identify targets for therapeutic intervention. We can take uh, the cell culture systems and look, screen through hundreds of thousands of chemical compounds to find uh, compounds that correct or mitigate the disease manifestations in the cell culture, test them in the animals, or we can develop biological approaches to treatment. That's what I'll be talking about. But we get down, we can, so we can use these uh, cell culture systems as assays to test and screen for potential treatments, but that brings us back to the, what I say is the most important and the most challenging part of this curve is to take treatments which may be very effective in the animal models to take them into patients and to use that information to develop treatment that's safe and effective uh, at reducing the disease burden in the patients. And that, that's where we're stuck. Ah, uh, boy, uh, I don't know if this is a good analogy. When, when I came back from sabbatical, our kitchen sink was clogged <laughs> from uh, when we were away and uh, had to get the plumber in to root it out. I think this process as with hereditary diseases has uh, kind of come around to this stage. Uh, and it's uh, beginning to back up. <laughs> we're, we're, uh, this, this is where we really need to focus our efforts, and this is where the uh, enterprise and, and bravery of uh, uh, companies uh, uh, comes into play. And I think, I think it's important for us to engage these companies, uh, uh, biotech and pharmaceutical companies, to bring to bear their resources and expertise to solve this problem so that we can uh, really uh, fulfill the promise of this curve and come back to patients with effective treatment. Now, as I said, I'm talking about two diseases uh, this morning, uh, muscular dystrophy and spinal muscular atrophy, uh, but I really want to focus on where we've come with these diseases and where we're going and uh, where the work is that still needs to be done, which again uh, involves uh, clinicians, uh, people who see these patients, uh, who connect the patients to the right kind of clinical trials and develop the clinical trials that are needed to uh, bring home an, an effective treatment. So that's what I'm going to be talking about. First, for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, this is the most common severe form of muscular dystrophy in children. It uh, uh, causes progressive proximal uh, weakness, so muscle weakness in the uh, shoulders and the hips to start off with. The, it's an X-linked disease, and the, uh, so only boys uh, are uh, fully affected by the disease. They start to become weak at usually around age three or four. And the weakness is gradually progressive to the point where they become wheelchair bound around age 10 or 12. Uh, and then uh, with progressive weakness uh, they, of the extremities and the respiratory muscles, uh, uh, they also get a cardiomyopathy. And they die, uh, they die usually without uh, any kind of therapeutic intervention uh, by their late teens or early 20s. Uh, and with uh, aggressive respiratory support, um, and cardiac management, uh, they, can, they can live now uh, into their, uh, you know, up to age 30. Now, the underlying pathology here is, if you look at the muscle, this is a problem with the muscle and uh, that causes the muscle weakness and uh, respiratory and cardiac manifestations. And if you look at the muscle pathologically, what you see is 
degeneration and regeneration. Uh, over on the, the left here are uh, necrotic muscle fibers. The uh, muscle fibers fall apart. The inflammatory cells uh, go in. Macrophages go gobble up the debris. And on the right here are regenerating muscle fibers. Muscle has a regenerative capacity. Uh, if any of us injure our muscle, uh, the muscle will regenerate uh, by activation of uh, what are called satellite cells around each muscle fiber. And uh, the, uh, you know, you can make new muscle fibers, but that regenerative capacity is limited. And with the ongoing degeneration of the uh, muscle fibers, uh, eventually the regenerative capacity gets depleted. And by the late stages of the disease, the muscle's replaced by fat and connective tissue. Uh, there's, there's really uh, very little muscle, muscle left by the time these patients uh, die from the disease. Now, uh, as I said, this is an X-linked, it's been long been known to be an X-linked recessive disorder. Uh, the clinical manifestations were first described back in the 1840s. So the disease had been well characterized clinically. Uh, uh, and then uh, just about 25 years ago in the uh, late 80s, the gene was identified. And this was really one of the first, probably the first uh, gene uh, to be identified by this process of positional cloning. To find the defect on the X chromosome, uh, which was in a gene uh, that was, uh, the, the product of the gene was given the name dystrophin. So a pro protein that is missing uh, because of mutations in patients with this disease. The mutations cause a loss of dystrophin, and that's the cause of the muscle breakdown in this disease. Now, the dystrophin gene is still one of the, this made it easy to find, I guess, it's still one of the largest genes uh, known. It, uh, it has 79 exons, these coding portions of the gene uh, that are spread over 2.3 or more million base pairs of DNA on the X chromosome. So it takes up more than 1% of the X chromosome, 0.1% uh, of the whole genome. There is a, another disease, uh, for a while it was thought to be separate a different disease uh, called Becker muscular dystrophy, also X-linked, but a milder disease. And it's caused by mutations in the same disease, in the same uh, gene, the dystrophin gene, but it has less severe manifestations. These patients can have onset later in life, maybe uh, quite normal into, their, into early adulthood. Uh, they have elevated creatine kinase, a sign of muscle breakdown, uh, and they variably develop uh, weakness uh, later in life. Now, uh, dystrophin, what is this uh, protein dystrophin that's missing in, in Duchenne dystrophy and deficient in Becker dystrophy? Dystrophin is now known to be a uh, uh, structural protein. Uh, it underlies the muscle plasma membrane, and it, its job, really, it, it is to hold the muscle plasma membrane together as the muscle contracts and relaxes. There's a lot of tension on muscle when it contracts uh, and and relaxes, and dystrophin forms a key structural link between uh, the, uh, the interior cytoskeleton, the actin uh, uh, cytoskeleton within the muscle fiber through a group, a cluster of proteins in the, in the plasma membrane to the uh, basal lamina, uh, the, the sheath that's outside the muscle fiber. So it's a, an important structural link in, in the integrity of the, uh, of the muscle plasma membrane. And, uh, loss of dystrophin leads to instability of the uh, muscle plasma membrane. The muscle membrane breaks when the muscle contracts and the contents of the muscle leak out. That leads to a very high creatine kinase level. And uh, calcium uh, enters into the fi muscle fiber, activates proteases, and uh, that leads to uh, degeneration of the muscle fiber. So uh, loss of dystrophin causes Duchenne dystrophy. Mutations in these other proteins uh, lead, also lead to muscular dystrophy, uh, usually we call limb girdle dystrophy. It can, can be very similar to Duchenne or Becker's, but has a different pattern of inheritance, uh, autosomal recessive rather than X-linked, because the genes are located on other chromosomes. Now, since the gene was identified back in the 1980s, uh, people have known that the distribution, looked at the distribution of mutations in the gene, and most of the mutations in this, uh, the cause of the disease are deletions of uh, one or more uh, exons, so internal deletions, uh, and they're distributed uh, uh, in such a way that uh, most of them are near the middle of the gene. This is uh, one end of the gene to the other, and where the 
where these deletions are distributed is mostly in the middle of the gene uh, and, uh, and some at the five prime end of the gene, the left side of the gene here. These deletions uh, are mostly around exons 45 to 55 out of 79. <clears throat> and the effect of these d internal partial deletions is to shift the translational reading frame. I I'll show that a little bit later. They, uh, you know, as the uh, ribosome comes along and, and reads uh, codons, uh, three nucleotides for each amino acid, uh, the, if the deletions that cause Duchenne dystrophy throw the reading frame off. They take out, they, they take out an odd number of, of nucleotides so that uh, the message uh, downstream from the, the point of the mutation is, is altered. And this leads to uh, a truncated protein that is lacking the, uh, the C-terminal end, which is encoded by the three-prime end of the gene here. And this uh, part of the protein is important for the protein stability. It's important for the interaction with the other structural proteins uh, the, uh, that, you know, help dystrophin to do its job. And uh, so disruption of the C-terminal end leads to an unstable protein which is rapidly degraded. And when you look for dystrophin in the muscle, you, you really can't see it uh, very much at all. Now, the, uh, knowing this, knowing that the cause of the disease is a loss of this protein and the result of the loss of the protein is muscle degeneration, uh, there are a number of different approaches to treatment that uh, uh, come to mind and have been actively pursued over the 25 years since this gene was identified. One is uh, to block muscle degeneration. As I said, the degeneration is due to activation of proteases. And uh, uh, one approach is to use uh, protease inhibitors like calpain. Uh, another is to stimulate muscle regeneration. And it's been <clears throat> figured out what factors are involved in muscle regeneration, like uh, insulin-like growth factor 1 and folostatin, and in particular, myostatin. Myostatin is a uh, hormone, a peptide hormone that uh, prevents muscle overgrowth. And if you inhibit myostatin, uh, that can stimulate muscle regeneration. And that's another approach that's been taken. Uh, now, there is another gene called, it's been discovered called eutrophin, and eutrophin is very similar to dystrophin. It's encoded elsewhere, so the patients have eutrophin. Another approach to treatment is to stimulate the production of eutrophin to compensate for the loss of dystrophin. And uh, yet another approach has been to uh, look at those patients who have uh, other mutations in the gene that lead to premature truncation. These are called nonsense mutations. They lead to a premature stop signal. And there are drugs that have been identified that uh, lead to uh, cause a read-through of premature stop signals, uh, nonsense suppression. And uh, amino commonly used uh, aminoglycosides like genomycin have this effect at low levels. And there have been trials of genomycin treatment. Uh, and a drug specifically designed uh, by a company in New Jersey, PTC Therapeutics, uh, to have this effect, which is more potent, uh, or said to be more potent than genomycin at having this effect of suppressing nonsense mutations uh, called adalurin uh, has been uh, in clinical trials. Now, and then, you know, just replacing the gene is another approach. The, the problem here is that the gene is so big that it's hard to uh, replace it. But there are uh, small versions of the gene that are, that are still quite functional that have been developed. And uh, there have been experiments to directly in inject uh, the gene into the muscle, the truncated mini dystrophin uh, constructs into the muscle, or to put them into a virus. First, uh, this was tried with adenovirus. The uh, problem with adenovirus is very immunogenic, uh, and you get a lot of inflammation, uh, not very much expression. And then more recently with adeno-associated virus, a smaller, less immunogenic uh, uh, virus. Uh, but here, too, all of these approaches uh, have been tried in animal models and in patients, some of them in patients, uh, with, uh, I, I should say, so far limited success. There's one approach uh, that uh, left here on this list that I would uh, like to uh, you know, spend a little bit more time talking about because I think it's the one that bears the best promise right now for treatment. Yeah. Just before you get to that, um, the first two approaches for 
Ah, yeah, you know, that's a good point. I think that's the appeal of those approaches is, you know, as you get down the list, you're getting more and more specific to Duchenne muscular dystrophy, but the, it, that's a good point, that the top two here are, uh, would work for any muscle disease, right? Or any muscle degeneration, any muscular dystrophy or muscle degeneration disease. And I think that that's, uh, uh, particularly when it comes to myostatin, that's attracted the interest of the pharmaceutical industry uh, Wyeth, Pfizer, and, and Novartis to uh, develop drugs that work on that, then it would work not just for Duchenne dystrophy and Becker, but would work for polymyositis or other kinds of muscular dystrophy, or even uh, perhaps, I think this is in the back of their mind, for age-related muscle weakness, or what's called sarcopenia, uh, that we all get as we get older. Uh, uh, you know, it, it starts in our 30s and then gets to be more of a problem as you get into your 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, this age-related muscle weakness. So some of the treatments that are being, uh, have been and will, are being tested for Duchenne muscular dystrophy may have broader applications. But the sense is that the more effective treatments are further down on the list. They're targeting the, the mutation, going right to the source of the problem. Uh, so you have more general approaches uh, that are less likely to be specific and then more specific uh, approaches that aren't, aren't going to work uh, uh, generally. That's a very good question. So I'd like to focus on this exon skipping idea, I guess because it has genomic re relevance and uh, it's something that's being looked at in a variety of other diseases as well, you know, genetic diseases. So explain a little bit about how that works. So again, Duchenne muscular dystrophy is usually caused by uh, gene deletions that sh have this effect of shifting the translational reading frame. And uh, what's been developed recently are oligonucleotides. These are short stretches of uh, nucleotides, 15, 20 nucleotides, uh, that can be used to promote the skipping of the exon, skip, can promote a, a skipping of the mutant exon or more commonly downstream exons to restore the, uh, the reading frame. And this has been an idea for a long time. I think what's led it to take off here in the last few years uh, is people have worked out chemical modifications of, that enhance the stability of oligonucleotides so that with a single injection, you can get a, an effect that lasts for months. Uh, they're very stable, in, in some ways kind of frighteningly stable. It's better to have a drug that turns over that's not going to be staying in the system for so long. Uh, but it, it does lead to a potential for a very effective treatment. And the results in uh, mouse models have been very, uh, very good. Now, there is a, a, a good, I, I think, a very good mouse model for Duchenne dystrophy called the MDX mouse that was identified some years ago. The mice are less, a lot less severely affected than, than patients, but they have a clear phenotype and uh, lack dystrophin. And when you, uh, when you inject uh, these oligonucleotides, uh, here, the uh, dystrophin uh, is uh, stained in red around each muscle fiber, uh, and uh, you can see without injection, there's no dystrophin. And then with injection at four weeks or 24 weeks of age, you get uh, nice dystrophin expression. I've tried to diagram here how this exon skipping works. Here are the exons uh, in the gene, and each three nucleotides encodes an amino acid. So, uh, you know, we have like glutamine, arginine, tryptophan, lysine, phenylalanine. And, and when there is a loss of an exon, one or more exons, it can throw the, uh, the reading frame off so that uh, the amino acids that are encoded are the wrong amino acids. because. Uh, the, the reading frame has been shifted, and you, lead, and you get a premature stop signal. Now, with this oligonucleotide, it binds to the messenger RNA near the splice site and alters the splicing uh, such that uh, this exon is skipped. And when this exon is skipped, the exon with mutation, you get, uh, you, re, you bring back the downstream of uh, amino acids. You may be missing part of the gene. Uh, here, I guess you're just missing the two amino acids between the arginine and the phenylalanine. But, you know, dystrophin is such a long protein that in the middle of the protein, you can get away without a few amino acids, and you still have a very functional protein. That's the idea behind this approach. Now, uh, in moving into the clinic, uh, first, uh, well, 10 years ago now, uh, a group in, uh, in Holland, uh, in Leiden, uh, did uh, experiments in cell culture with this uh, oligonucleotide-induced exon skipping. And here uh, you see the, uh, the 
messenger RNA without the skipping, and here you see that a shorter messenger RNA is made with the oligonucleotide. And here you see a muscle fiber in cell culture, a myo myotube in cell culture, and you see that uh, the dystrophin here stained in green is nicely present. And then they went on, this uh, paper was published about five years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, to inject the oligonucleotide directly into a patient muscle. Here they had four different patients. They biopsied the muscle uh, after the injection. And here, here you see what a Duchenne patient looks like uh, without the treatment. And you have uh, uh, no dystrophin except for occasional muscle fibers where there's a a spontaneous mutation that reverses the effect of the mutation, uh, so-called revertant fibers. Here's a control uh, patient or control, healthy control for comparison. See the green around each muscle fiber in cross-section. And here are the four patients who are injected. And you see, you know, very nice, uh, you know, uh, levels of dystrophin after the injection. So the, the, the protein is clearly made when you inject the, uh, uh, the oligonucleotide into the muscle. And then they went on uh, more recently, also, this was also published in the New England Journal in, in 2011 with a multicenter study, uh, a small phase two uh, proof of concept multicenter study with a subcutaneous uh, delivery. And this was remarkable. So it makes sense that if you inject directly into the muscle, it works. But if you inject it subcutaneously, it works generally to uh, the, the oligonucleotide gets into muscle uh, throughout the body and corrects the splicing defect. Now, part of that might be because the muscle fiber membrane is so leaky in this disease that the oligonucleotide can get in easily, uh, but it uh, worked remarkably well. So uh, a biotech company named Prosensa uh, it, in uh, Leiden picked this up, and uh, a larger pharmaceutical company, GSK, has picked it up from Prosensa uh, and carried this uh, into full, full development mode. Uh, it, uh, remarkable investment uh, from uh, a, a large company in a relatively rare disease. So uh, Duchenne dystrophy affects about one in 3,000 boys. And uh, the treatment is exon specific. Uh, so it's only a subset of those patients who will respond to this kind of treatment. Now, uh, so in this uh, uh, multicenter study, they saw an increase in dystrophin in the muscle. And uh, it was an uncontrolled, uh, open label study. Uh, they, it looked like maybe they were having an effect on the, uh, on the walking. Uh, so here's the uh, effect on the six-minute timed walk after a year. And again, this is uncontrolled. They're, they're looking at comparing to untreated patients, uh, you know, that weren't in the same study. Uh, so it's not, a, not a really a fair comparison. But it shows the typical course of the disease is as these patients get older, here six, eight, ten years, uh, they get better, they do better in terms of their walking uh, gradually like any uh, child would, but when they get to a certain point, uh, their walking just really stops. You know, when they, as I said, they get wheelchair bound around age 10 to 12. And with this treatment, the patients that they followed uh, after the treatment, uh, majority of them after one year were doing okay, and they've now looked uh, out two uh, and even three years, and they're still, most of them are still doing, uh, doing pretty well. So it was encouraging enough for GSK to get involved, and now uh, there is, uh, well, nearing, nearing conclusion, I guess the enrollment's uh, finished for the phase two uh, U.S. study, uh, 14 sites, 54 patients, and a, a, a large uh, phase three uh, placebo-controlled study in 30 sites, 20 different countries around the world, 180 patients. We should know uh, within the next year or two whether this treatment is effective. Uh, GSK is putting a major investment into, uh, into this treatment, and uh, it'll, it'll tell us whether this, whether this approach works, whether, it, uh, whether it, it restores dystrophin and whether it has a clinical effect. They're using this timed walk as the primary outcome measure. Now, there's another company, uh, uh, it used to be called AVI and is now called Sarepta. Uh, it's a startup biotech company uh, that had been based in, uh, in Washington State but just, just recently moved to uh, Cambridge. Uh, and Sarepta is using a different kind of chemistry uh, in the oligonucleotides. They're called morpholinos. And uh, the uh, results suggests that morpholinos may be just as effective but with less toxicity than the, uh, uh, the uh, oligonucleotides developed by Prosensa. And here's a similar experiment where they uh, injected, uh, this is a study done in England, they injected 
directly into the muscle uh, and looked at the untreated muscle and treated muscle, and you see no dystrophin here, and then here in, in black, uh, the, again, the ring around each fiber showing nice correction of the uh, dystrophin deficiency. Uh, and uh, as with the uh, Prosenza oligonucleotide, they see uh, uh, very nice uh, or relatively nice expression with uh, subcutaneous or systemic injection as well as with direct injection. Now, just recently, it's funny, it was a small company, their stock went down when they got some negative result and then came way up again uh, when they had some positive results uh, in October. They reported at meetings in October. Uh, but it's it, it, a small study, uh, just a handful of patients, uh, they uh, claimed to see a dramatic effect on the six minute timed walk. And, <laughs> that did wonders for their, their stock. It, they, they too are now planning to go into a larger scale trial. So both of these uh, uh, you know, de therapeutic development efforts are uh, actively underway, and I think we should get uh, results here before too long as to whether that will indicate whether this approach will work. And a lot of people in the field are optimistic about it. So what are the issues? Uh, a research nurse in our group, uh, Angela, I don't think she's here, is uh, always talking about issues, and I re realize that when she talks about issues, she's talking about problems. <laughs> um, at, you know, potential problems are safety, first of all. So in the Prosenza GSK study, there, the, a lot of the patients get injection site reactions, and uh, a lot of the patients get proteinuria. And uh, there's concern about these and about whether there might be more uh, serious inflammatory reactions in some of the patients, but it's a large enough study, we'll, we'll get a handle on that by the end. Uh, there's a problem with delivery and efficiency and stability of delivery. As I said, the oligonucleotides are very eff effectively distributed in Duchenne muscle. Whether this approach will work in other muscle diseases, like we talked about, is, is an open question. Uh, it's still an unanswered question is how much dystrophin do you need to uh, mitigate the disease manifestations? Uh, these treatments and the studies that have been done so far can get up to 20 to 30 percent normal levels, and it's a question of whether that's enough. Uh, probably it is, but we do, the, the trials will answer that question. And then the other interesting question in terms of genomic medicine is uh, where do we go with this? <laughs> so what's the path ahead? The problem here is that every patient has a different mutation, and the treatment is targeted to the mutation, the specific mutation. There are many uh, exons that need to be targeted, and you have to know exactly what the mutation is in order to know what uh, exon to target with the, uh, with the oligonucleotide therapy. So uh, each, each of these oligonucleotides uh, need to be developed and tested. Uh, the two companies are, are both working on the same uh, exon, exon 51, and uh, each, but there, there are many other exons that have to be uh, uh, addressed, and each will need evidence of safety and efficacy in order to get regulatory approval, and really just to know whether they work. Let's see. So uh, here, the companies picked uh, Exxon 51 because that's the one that uh, is, you know, best targeted in the largest percentage of patients. But of the deletions, uh, only about 18 percent can be predicted to be corrected by Exxon 51 sk skipping. So of total patients, about two thirds have uh, have deletions. So that's only about 12 percent of patients will have a uh, will be amenable to this uh, treatment with this particular exon. And, you know, both companies are looking down the list, uh, exon 45, 44, 53. Each exon you target after that. So this is a different therapeutic that has to be targeted based on the precise diagnosis of that patient to know that this oligonu skipping this exon would uh, be likely to uh, correct their defect. It gets to smaller and smaller percentages of patients. If you get up to 12 different uh, oligonucleotides, uh, picking the right oligonucleotide for each one, that would cover three quarters of the uh, uh, of the uh, pa of the deletions, so uh, half of the patients. So this is really uh, the beginnings of what we're seeing is personalized medicine. Uh, it's a it's a kind of medicine which is specifically targeted not just to the gene but to the mutation in the gene that needs to be corrected, and that's a challenge. But it's a challenge that. Uh, I think uh, is going to be overcome bit by bit. It has a lot of issues with regard to safety, efficacy, FDA approval, and so on uh, that are, are being worked out um, <coughs> here in Bethesda and, and elsewhere around the world. Now, 
One thing that would help with this is uh, to have a good biomarker to give an early read as to whether a uh, particular oligonucleotide is working uh, before you see clinical manifestations or clinical effects of the treatment. So a non-invasive biomarker that will give an early indication of biological effects. And uh, Ami Mancodi here in the audience is uh, working in our group and others uh, uh, on an imaging study uh, here at the NIH doing cardiac and skeletal muscle uh, imaging to see if we can pick up uh, or if she can pick up a, uh, uh, we can pick up a, uh, uh, a an effect. It's uh, riding on the uh, phase two multicenter U.S. trial of uh, oligonucleotide therapy by GSK targeting exon 51. And uh, so looking at cardiac and skeletal muscle, MRI and ultrasound. Here, here's a uh, image from university, a group at the University of Florida that's also involved in this kind of work with uh, Sarepta. And uh, you can see that there are a lot of changes in uh, the muscle MRI, uh, but uh, the question is whether the drugs, uh, the oligonucleotides, correct these changes in a way that can be seen early uh, in the course of treatment. Okay, so I'd like to go on now uh, in the time that's remaining to talk about another disease that's, I guess I say, close to my heart. <laughs> it's one, it's an important disease, uh, the, said to be the most common severe hereditary disease of infancy and early childhood, and that's spinal muscular atrophy. Now here it's, it's a uh, autosomal recessive disease, um, and uh, it affects about one in eight to 10,000. Uh, new babies, uh, and uh, so the carrier frequency is about one in 40. Here in this room, there would be two or three people who would be carrying the mutation, would be at risk of having children or grandchildren affected by the disease. Uh, it uh, uh, causes early onset progressive symmetrical weakness uh, and muscle atrophy due to motor neuron loss and, and muscle denervation. So the problem is not directly in the muscle here, but a loss of innervation, innervation of the muscle because the motor neurons are lost. And here the gene that was identified uh, back in the, mid, in the 90s uh, uh, was given the name survival motor neuron or, or SMN. So it's a loss of uh, SMN, a relative loss of SMN that leads to uh, this uh, clinical phenotype. Here's a picture from a, uh, uh, from Victor Dubowitz from some time ago showing the severe early onset form of the disease, uh, the babies are kind of floppy like uh, little rag dolls and really don't do very well. The survival is limited. Now, a pre pretty bad disease. Now, there are milder forms of the disease. Here's a patient I saw on a trip to Dominican Republic a few years ago and uh, uh, chose a patient with milder, uh, we call type 2 form of the disease. And there's still milder forms uh, with long term survival. Uh, Pretty, still pretty severe weakness, but uh, uh, not to the point where it, uh, it limits survival in the way the severe type 1 or Wurtnig-Hoffman form of the disease does. Now here the gene that was identified back in the 90s, uh, the SMN gene, it's interesting in that it's present in multiple copies uh, and two different varieties. There's SMN1, which is uh, lost in the disease, and SMN2, which is kind of a backup gene. It's very similar to SMN1. Uh, differs at only a, a uh, you know, there's only one nucleotide difference which really accounts for the difference in the, in the uh, function of these uh, two genes. The coding uh, sequence is the same, but there's a single nucleotide difference that leads to an effect on exon splicing such that a particular exon, exon number seven, is missing in the messenger RNA transcript that is encoded by SMN2. So you get full-length SMN transcript from SMN1, uh, and you get some full-length transcript from SMN2, but the majority of transcript messenger RNA from SMN2 is lacking exon 7, and again is, uh, you know, it's an unstable protein, it's uh, uh, rapidly degraded, and it's less functional than the full-length form. Now, the disease is usually caused by deletions, uh, uh, deletions of SMN1, uh, just like the deletions in dystrophin, although here oftentimes the whole gene is missing, but the patients still have SMN2. So they don't have a complete loss of, of SMN, they have a relative depletion of SMN, uh, and that's what leads to the uh, disease manifestations. Now, uh, what is SMN? Uh, SMN uh, is expressed everywhere. It's not just in the, in the muscle or motor neurons, it's uh, in every cell, and it plays an important role, ironically, in 
uh, splicing. The, the, the normal function of SMN, the, the best established normal function of SMN is uh, to put together this complex of proteins called the spliceosome, which uh, is responsible for splicing introns out of mes messenger RNA to lead to a mature uh, messenger RNA transcript. In addition, uh, SMN uh, likely has a role in the axonal transport of messenger RNA. So here's a, uh, here's a neuron uh, in, uh, in culture with an axon that uh, extends out uh, from the cell body. Uh, here's a growth cone. And you can see SMN in the cytoplasm, in the cell body, in, in the uh, nucleus, but you also see it distributed along the axon, in particular at the growth cone. Now, there is protein synthesis occurring out here at a distance from the cell body, and SMN uh, in promoting the transport of messenger RNA uh, may play an important role in, uh, pr in supporting protein synthesis at a distance from the cell body. Now, why are motor neurons particularly vulnerable? I mean, this is a protein that's in every cell. It plays an important role in, uh, in RNA splicing. It may, be, it may be because of the shape and dimensions of motor neurons. They have long uh, axons, multiple muscle fibers that they innervate, and large nerve terminals. And they may be, be particularly vulnerable to splicing defects uh, in the messenger RNA. Uh, and uh, or motor neurons may be particularly dependent on this tra axonal transport of, uh, of messenger RNA. Now, since the gene was identified, SMA, SMA has been reproduced uh, in a variety of model systems, uh, cell-free biochemical assays, cell culture, and a whole menagerie of animals. We have worms, flies, zebrafish, uh, and mice that are all deficient in, in, in SMN, and they all develop some variety of motor weakness. Uh, you know, the, the, wor the worms don't crawl very well. The fish like our goldfish at home sometimes go belly up because <laughs> they, they, they just can't swim very well. And, and the flies uh, at the larval stage, they, uh, they, don't, uh, they don't crawl around very well. And the mice, the mice look a lot like the patients, I think, a mouse version of the patients. So here, here we see uh, a wild-type mouse, uh, and here a uh, untreated uh, mouse with SMN deficiency. These, this mouse model was developed at Ohio State. And, uh, you see the mouse is very weak at an early age. It doesn't grow very well, it doesn't feed very well, and dies uh, within, in the mouse uh, within about 15 days. Now, uh, there are drugs that have been tested in the mice, and the drugs actually can, do, uh, can have a significant effect, uh, in this case, even after the onset of the disease. So it comes on around three or four days. Uh, by five days, they're, they're starting to get pretty weak. Here is a drug that uh, called trichostatin that inhibits histone deacetylase, and that has the effect of uh, opening up the chromatin around the SMN gene, allowing um, more transcription of the SMN, the remaining SMN2 uh, gene to uh, in, in, increase uh, SMN protein levels. And here you can see that it has an effect, a significant effect, but it only uh, it increases the survival by about three or four days. Now, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's an effect, but it's not, uh, it's not that much of one. Now, whoops, oh yeah, that's the, uh, <laughs> my special effect there showing that arrow. And then uh, work in our lab has shown that you can also block the degradation of SMN. So you can stimulate its production and block its degradation uh, with a drug called bortezomib. This is a drug that uh, is a proteasome inhibitor. So it blocks the... Uh, the complex of proteins that's responsible for degradation of proteins like SMN increases the levels and improves the motor behavior and spinal cord pathology in the mice. And this effect of bortezomib is synergistic with uh, trichostatin. Now, I was work done by Deborah Kwan and, and Barrington Burnett in our lab. Deborah and Barrington have identified a uh, specific enzyme that targets uh, SMN for degradation called Mindbomb1 or Mib1. And uh, this might be a more selective, rather than in, inhibiting proteasomes in general, the proteases, this might be a more specific target, uh, and that's something that we, we are working on now, or the people in our lab are working on now. Now, another interesting finding, uh, Heather Narver is a veterinarian, a mouse veterinarian across the street in, in our building, uh, kind of took, I think she kind of took pity on these little mice. And, 
uh, had the idea of giving them some additional nutritional support, gave them uh, infant formula uh, once or twice a day. And that had a dramatic effect. It did not have an effect on its own, uh, but it had a dramatic effect on enhancing uh, the response to treatment with this uh, drug trichostatin. So that rather than a three or four day effect, uh, it was uh, up to, uh, it increased the survival two to three fold. Uh, and uh, this is something I'll get back to at the end, the, the importance of nutrition. Now, there have been efforts, uh, screening assays and efforts to develop drugs based on a variety of different assays, uh, just stimulating the SMN promoter to increase the levels of the transcript, increasing the retention of this exon 7 uh, and uh, with oligonucleotides and drugs, and uh, increasing the protein levels by blocking its degradation, working further downstream to enhance its function and in, and, or to increase the survival of SMN deficient cells. And there are drugs that are various stages of development now. A, a couple uh, that are in uh, clinical trials, a drug from uh, Trophos in France, a drug uh, that's, uh, it's, it's been a while, uh, over uh, 12 years now uh, in development, but it's uh, finally getting into the clinic, uh, a drug uh, championed by a uh, patient organization, Families of SMA, taken up by a biotech company, Repligen. And just yesterday, a press release that Pfizer uh, has been encouraged by the phase one uh, results with this drug uh, and uh, quinazoline that uh, blocks the uh, degradation of the messenger RNA for SMN. And uh, the, uh, so Pfizer's uh, put it, just like uh, GSK with uh, Prosensa and the oligonucleotides for uh, uh, Duchenne dystrophy, Pfizer's putting a, a, a big uh, effort into supporting uh, the development of this drug. And then uh, tetracycline, uh, derivatives from a biotech company called Paratech to enhance the splicing. And here at the NIH and NCATS, a uh, screen was done uh, that identified a class of compounds that increase SMN levels called aryl piperidines. And uh, there's also a, a, a similar effort uh, that's uh, underway at Novartis uh, up in Cambridge. Now, ag again, as with Duchenne dystrophy, you can take more general approaches, but uh, working close to the cause of the problem, working at the level, at the level of the gene or the mutant transcript uh, uh, gives a more specific and, and uh, potentially more effective uh, approach to treatment. Now, uh, so that can be done by gene therapy, gene replacement, or again by oligonucleotide therapy. Now here, not promoting exon skipping, but promoting exon retention, and I'll just describe that briefly here. Now, First, with gene replacement, uh, you can surprisingly get the SMN gene. This is a small gene compared to dystrophin. You can get this gene into uh, the spinal cord, into motor neurons, with uh, peripheral injection in mice. So intravenous injection, uh, the right kind of uh, adeno-associated virus uh, gets taken up into the mouse spinal cord and into motor neurons. And here, uh, here's another approach with intramuscular injection, a group in Lausanne. Uh, showing uh, in a monkey uh, uptake into motor neurons in the, uh, in the spinal cord. And uh, was it? a couple of years ago now, in, well, in 2010, uh, there were three different groups reported effective treat remarkably effective treatment with uh, gene replacement in, uh, in SMN deficient uh, mice. Uh, here, uh, a group at uh, Ohio State, Ryan Kaspar's group, uh, was one of those three papers shows, again, in the mice, so these mice, again, die at 15 days, uh, but with the treatment, uh, they can show that they get the SMN into the motor neurons in the spinal cord. They have an effect on the behavior uh, and, and a remarkable effect on the survival. So with just one or two injections in the first few days of life, these, these mice, which normally die at 15 days, live out a normal lifespan. You can cure the disease in, in these animals uh, with uh, just uh, one or two injections of, uh, of AAV carrying the SMN gene. It's pretty remarkable. Um, if we had, I, I like to say, uh, if we had mice as patients, we'd be all set. <laughs> Unfortunately, we've got to figure out how to get this to work in patients. Now, uh, the other approach that I mentioned, oligonucleotides, uh, was developed by, uh, first by uh, uh, Adrian Craner's group at Cold Spring Harbor. They screened for oligonucleotides that uh, bind to the messenger RNA around exon 7. That will, and some of these will 
promote skipping of the exon, some of them will promote retention of the exon. Some, so depending upon exactly where they're binding and whether they're affecting, uh, how they're affecting the splice site. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, uh, uh, what they found is that with inje injecting this into the, in into the cerebral ventricles, they get long-term expression uh, and uh, benefit. So here, uh, exon 7 inclusion, which is at a low level in the untreated animals, here for after a single injection, uh, these oligonucleotides, uh, just one injection, uh, you get, whoops, you get, uh, uh, you know, effects that last up to uh, six months. Uh, you know, vir virtually normal uh, expression of the protein uh, a after six months. And then more recently, uh, they showed uh, a, an, a marked a survival effect uh, with, also with uh, subcutaneous injection. So you wonder how that works. Some of it gets into the central nervous system. But uh, some of it might be working peripherally also, and they came up with an idea that it might be having this effect uh, through, uh, by inc correcting a deficiency of uh, insulin-like growth factor one, which is a, 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 has neuro is a neurotrophic factor for motor neurons. And uh, it, it's not an effect directly on IGF-1, but on a binding protein, IGF-ALS, uh, acid-labeled subunit, uh, that correct the deficiency of this binding protein that corrects the levels of IGF-1, and that has a beneficial effect on the mice. But here again, so the mice without treatment die within 15 days. Whoops, <laughs> that again. And the mice uh, with treatment, uh, increasing doses of the treatment uh, have, uh, you know, survival that goes up to uh, a normal mouse uh, life expectancy of uh, more, you know, one to two years. Now. Uh, this is a, a news article in Nature Medicine that just came out. If you want to read more about it, it's a good place to uh, get caught up on where, where therapeutics development efforts are now. Uh, but just to uh, illustrate here what a remarkable effect you can have on these mice. So here's a mouse without treatment, dies uh, as, a, as a newborn, and here's a mouse with the treatment who looks like a normal mouse. So uh, calling the backup means getting uh, you know, activating uh, SMN2, stabilizing the transcript, and uh, enhancing the retention of exon 7, and uh, this is the effect. So again, you know, very effective treatment in mice. How do we, how do we get that to work in patients? Uh, ISIS uh, Pharmaceuticals has taken this into patients in, in phase one studies, uh, intrathecal injection, uh, and they have a lot of support from Biogen IDEC, financial support from Biogen IDEC. But it's a challenge. It's a challenge to get this to work in patients. Uh, we found this now with uh, several diseases. People are much more heterogeneous than animals. The, the laboratory animals that we use are purebred. Uh, they have a very predictable phenotype. As I mentioned, the phenotype varies in, in, in patients from very severe to less severe. Uh, so you know, dealing with the heterogeneity is an issue. Also, this disease, uh, after the early onset, uh, those patients that survive have very stable course, very slow disease progression after onset. So showing an effect in the survivors uh, on the progression uh, is hard. And uh, most in important, or an important aspect of this uh, issue uh, to address is the need for the treatment to start early. In the mice, you have to give the treatment within the first few days. Uh, and the challenge, the clinical challenge we have to face is how do we identify patients with this disease early enough to have, a, have an effect. Uh, one way to do that, you know, we can do genetic testing. It's very easy and generally available kind of genetic test, uh, not as cheap as you would like, but uh, there are efforts to reduce the cost to do genetic testing at, at, at birth at, in newborns. But it's hard, there's a chicken and egg kind of situation of justifying broad newborn screening to pick up a disease that affects one in eight to 10,000 without having the treatment. And it may be hard to develop the treatment without, uh, without having newborn screening. So I think, I think this is an overcomable problem. It's something we've had discussions in NINDS and the Genome Institute is how to, how to deal with this. Uh, the uh, Child Health, uh, NICHD, has supported development of uh, newborn screening for, for SMA with the idea that this uh, would, would be something that would spur therapeutics development, and uh, as well as providing the information to, uh, to families about the diagnosis. But uh, uh, this, this is an issue that, uh, that needs to be addressed, uh, I think, uh, for, this, uh, for this approach to be successful. Now, 
what did I learn from my time at Novartis? Uh, the company, uh, remarkably, like other companies, has taken an interest in rare diseases like this, rare genetic diseases. Uh, there are about 40 different rare diseases that uh, Novartis is working on uh, now. Uh, and so it, it was fun as an academic investigator to be up there and see that work, uh, see the company using the expertise that they have and resources they have for therapeutics development to take on diseases like SMA. Uh, how do they choose the diseases and uh, how, do they de how do they develop uh, uh, what we call a clinical proof of concept? Uh, so to show that a treatment works in, er in early phase clinical trials. They select diseases based on unmet medical need. So clearly we have that with SMA. Strong biological rationale for the therapeutic approach. Increasing SMN levels is, uh, clearly works in animal models and uh, would be expected to work in patients as well. Favorable risk benefit ratio to have the right kind of safety profile on, uh, for the potential therapeutic agent to match the, d the disease manifestations. You don't want to use cancer chemotherapy type uh, drug for headaches, uh, for example. Uh, you want to match the risk to the benefit. Every drug has uh, side effects and, you know, the issue here, whoa, the issue here is getting this off. Um, let me see if I can get this done. Get a little klutzy as I get older here. Uh, Maybe, oh, let's see, maybe I have to do an end show. Oh, I know. Yeah, okay. Uh, so the, uh, and then pharmacodynamics, this is an important thing. Uh, having a biomarker that tells you that you've engaged the target. So just to know, it's called a pharmacodynamic measure, to know that the drug, the potential drug, uh, has the biological effect in a patient that you want it to have. Uh, to know whether the, the, the drug's working biologically and then to know whether it's working clinically. And then clinical trial readiness, to know that patients are available, uh, to have reliable clinical outcome measures and natural history data, to know that you're having an impact on the, on the clinical manifestations of the disease. Now, uh, we, we have each of these with uh, SMA. We have unmet need, strong biological rationale, favorable risk-benefit ratio with the drugs that are being considered. Uh, this is the hardest one to know that in, in the central nervous system we're having an effect with a treatment that's designed to increase SMN levels. But there's a lot that's been done recently with developing good tests for uh, SMN levels and uh, to get things ready for clinical trials. Uh, there have been clinical trials, there are clinical trials ongoing, but to make sure that the patients are available and willing and uh, uh, e interested in getting involved in the clinical trials, the clinicians are interested in referring patients uh, for clinical trials, and uh, that there are good outcome measures and natural history data. So we're, we're, we're getting close. Now one, one thing to say just at the end here, I've mentioned before in other talks, is uh, an interesting thing that's been going on here with Duchenne dystrophy uh, and, and spinal muscular atrophy is uh, that the patients are doing better. <laughs> I mean, all the while we're trying to develop drugs, small molecules, gene therapy, oligonucleotide therapy, uh, the patients seem to be doing better. The survival is improved, as I said, with Duchenne dystrophy from 20 to 30 years. Uh, so 10-year increase in survival over the last few years, over the last decade. And also uh, with uh, uh, spinal muscular atrophy, here's a study done by Petra Kaufman, who's now in our institute, uh, did this when she was at Columbia in New York. Uh, showed, just reviewed the history of the severe type 1 SMA patients here back in the 80s and early 90s. Most of them died within, uh, <clears throat> with, within a few years, uh, really within a, two or three years of diagnosis. Uh, but then looking at patients in the late 90s into the, uh, the aughts here, uh, the current uh, uh, century, <laughs> the uh, survival is much better. And likely, this is probably due, there's a follow-up study that's being done now, uh, but uh, it's probably due to a better respiratory nutritional support. You can offer these patients a lot uh, with feeding tubes and uh, external non-invasive uh, ventilatory support, and good, uh, you know, aggressive respiratory management. And, and the quality of life is, if you ask the patients and the families, is not that bad. It's, uh, uh, you know, it, it's pretty remarkable what can be done uh, just by looking to see what do we currently have to offer these patients in terms of symptomatic support, respiratory nutritional support, and how can we make that better. So uh, just to close, uh, 
This is our group over across the street. Uh, there are a few extra people in this picture, but uh, uh, this is the neurogenetics branch. It's uh, our, our lab, and uh, in particular, I want to talk, uh, point out Karsten Bonneman, who uh, has a group that's working on uh, early onset uh, neuromuscular diseases. Craig Blackstone, uh, Ricardo Rodas in that group working on spastic paraplegia. Uh, wanted to highlight Ami Mancodi in the, in the back there who's doing the Duchenne muscle imaging uh, study that I mentioned, and uh, a nice group in our lab working on spinal muscular atrophy, uh, including Barrington Burnett, uh, Deborah Kwan, Catherine Burcino, uh, and, and others. So uh, this when <laughs> it's been said uh, some time ago when I say, uh, I, I mean we, and when I say we, I mean them. <laughs> so the, the work that's been done uh, has really been done by that group over across the street. Thank you. No comments or questions about Fishback. I have one. Go. About how large the nucleotides are so. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the question was, how large are the oligonucleotides? I think they're about 15 to 20 uh, nucleotides long. And, uh, you know, and for the uh, Duchenne uh, treatment, they get into the muscle very well. They're pretty widely distributed, but it's, you know, it's really in the muscle where they're needed, and they get, they get into that. It, you know, there's less entrance into the central nervous system. Uh, you can do that in the newborn period, uh, but uh, in animals at least. Uh, but to get into the central nervous system, it, it hel helps to give it intrathecally or uh, into the cerebral ventricles. So the clinical trials are using intrathecal delivery uh, for, for these diseases. So you're not really terribly worried about toxicity? Uh, uh, yeah, we're always worried about toxicity. So the question is, are we worried about toxicity? And uh, uh, you know, the, 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 there are some you know, concerns uh, based on the animal studies and the clinical studies that have been done with oligonucleotides. Uh, um, I don't know, it, I think maybe it goes back to Hippocrates or somebody that uh, every drug is toxic, it's just a matter of dose. <laughs> and uh, so to get the dose right, I think, is the challenge here. You couldn't get sick for longer, yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Would it be reasonable to assume that the SMN therapy, at least that therapy, could be applied to the adult form of motor neuron disease? Ah, you know, you mean to ALS? or uh, yeah. Luke Gehrig's disease. Uh, you know, there's been some evidence that there's an association with SMN copy number or SMN levels with, uh, uh, with ALS. And it's been back and forth. I think the results are, the results are really mixed on that. Uh, it's, it's not a strong correlation. I mean, I think that's the hope that there might be some way to get, uh, that SMN might be important in other motor neuron diseases. And it's something that we're, we're investigating too. Uh, but it, it's not clear that that will happen. Um, uh, it might. Please join me in thanking Dr. Fishman for coming. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> oh, yeah, so I could talk, you know, where it comes up, for example, is with 